the craziest things happen on road trips. On this episode, we're going to look at the road trips of all road trips, where Paul is taking his first missionary journey on this episode of Inverse. Hey guys, welcome to Inverse. We are in a special segment this year, looking at 13 weeks in the book of Acts, chapter 1 through 28. And there's so much to cover, so we're just hitting kind of the basic highlights and going from topic to topic. And this topic, we're looking at the first missionary journey. I think there's about three in total, mm -hmm. and the last voyage to Rome. And there's a lot that happens. And so you guys out there, if you guys have a map, you want to follow on geographically or Google Maps, or if you have your phone, you can look up some, some images. It will be helpful. But here, we're not going to actually do a geographical study. We're just going to hit some highlights in the text. Let's have a word of prayer. And let's see, Jared, I think you're up to bat. To All right. Hmm. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, and we pray that as we look at the life of Paul, that you would give us courage, grace, understanding uh, into what's happening here, and you'd help us to apply it to our lives. Amen. In your name we pray, amen. 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 Hey, Sebastian, can you read Acts chapter 13, verse... 38? Sure. Okay. And 39. <laughs> okay. And do whatever extra you want for extra credit. Sounds good. Good. <laughs> it says, therefore... Let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. Okay, hmm. see here, this is one of those um, Pauline sermons recorded in the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. Kelly, what's, what's going on here? Can, can you set us up? What, yeah. what have we covered so far and kind of pick us up to 13? So, well, as you said, this is Paul's first missionary journey. So he's doing ministry. Um, he has, I've been rebuking people. <laughs> um, and then he goes to a synagogue and they're like, hey, do you have something to say? And Paul, ever a man of opportunity, is like, yes. <laughs> and so then he stands up and preaches one of his sermons. And what we read uh, a couple moments ago was kind of the, the punchline of all his messages, yeah. which is bringing it always back to Jesus. So he kind of starts through Israel's history. And he's like, all these things are fulfilled in Jesus, and mm -hmm. no one else could have fulfilled it like he mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's go to chapter 13, verse 1. And uh, Jared, can you read 1 through 3 there, and then we'll pick up from there. Yeah. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, uh, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Now, let's spend some time there. What's going on there? What can we juice out? Put in the Vitamix and let it all juice out. <laughs> what the flavors come out? Sebastian? I'm a fan of Jamba. Um, Jamba. <laughs> so I, I think that you know, this is a fascinating text because it's telling the church to acknowledge the call that Paul ha that God has upon Paul and Barnabas. Mm -hmm. But we see Paul constantly trying to reach out to the Jews, mm -hmm. which raises the issue of the tension between our burdens and what God is actually calling us to do, what, we, what God's will is versus what we want. Wait, are you saying, I mean, we see, we see this from the text, but there's a difference between burden and calling? Absolutely, because Paul had a burden to reach his people, so he's constantly trying to reach out to the Jews, but hitherto, all we see is him escaping, right, mm -hmm. by the hair on his chinny, chin, chin. It's like, oh, the Jews are here to try to get, oh, okay, now he's slipping out windows and doing all this stuff to escape for his life, when it's like God never called you to go to these people. Mm. God was calling you to the Gentiles. He told that to Ananias, right, mm -hmm. when we explored that in that episode, that he says, he's a v chosen vessel for me to go to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So, but Paul's constantly ministering to the Jews. Mm -hmm. So now it's like, look, separate me, these people, the Holy Spirit says, for the work that I called them to do. Mm -hmm. And it took that divine act through a prophet to basically finally get them pushed into what God 
had originally planned for Paul and Barnabas. Yeah, I'm just thinking right now, I, mean, I haven't planned to talk about this, but just when you were talking, it reminded me that I've always had a burden. I, I am um, of Korean descent, mm -hmm. and if you're asking North or South, it's we're all the same, but if you're asking, <laughs> it's probably South Korean descent. But I'm an American but of South Korean descent. I did descent. not know you were Korean. Uh, I did, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyway, so I've always had a, a particular <laughs> burden for Koreans or Korean Americans, those mm -hmm. born in the United States, and. Mm -hmm. And I always felt that I wanted my ministry to go for it. It was actually in a deep conversation with another one of our, in our gang, Israel. This was like a billion years ago. Not that we believe in, anyway, so <laughs> we, 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 we had this conversation and he said that you may have a burden for the Koreans, but the best way to help the, the Koreans is to, it was, it was a different project that we we're doing called GYC. Mm -hmm. And so in a, in a, after almost 20 years in retrospect, uh, looking back on it, my burden has still remained the same. And I've looked at what the, 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 the calling or the openings of, of ministerial callings the Lord has given me. And it's always been not really in this avenue. It's been in other ways. Right. But in the larger picture, uh, it's, the, it's, impacted. it's impacted Koreans in a different way. I've seen it in my family, mm. you know, being the only person that was converted to the church in my family to Christ. You know, I had a burden for, I'm the oldest of seven. Mm -hmm. So it's like, man, how am I gonna reach my parents and you know, all these different people. And here I am, you know, doing shows like Inverse and traveling and preaching and all these different things. And it seems like it's not having an effect on my family. Mm -hmm. But I always took cue from Noah's experience, right? That he was doing what God called him to do, which provided an ark to save his family. Mm -hmm. Well, lo and behold, eventually, you know, through that process, my parents ended up watching me preaching a sermon at GYC, mm -hmm. and they tuned in online, live, and watched like, it. Like, do they watch Inverse? Yes, they do watch Okay, it. say, hey, hey, uh, the <laughs> synopsis mom. mom and dad. <laughs> 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 Hi, mom. Yeah, cool. So when you, when you think about this, this concept that I didn't try to reach my parents that direct rate, that's how you come in, right? Because when you're fresh <laughs> in the church like Paul was, you know, you're kind of radical and crazy. Like, you're just like all out, no yeah. holds barred. Yeah. And I think it turned them off. But as I kept walking what God was calling me to do, what he was using me to accomplish was having an impact on them, mm -hmm. which made them more open to spiritual things. And now my brother, one of my brothers is already baptized and active in ministry mm -hmm. um, and so serving TJ. Christ. Yes, my brother TJ. Hey, TJ. <laughs> what's the family shout out episode. <laughs> what, what Sebastian is saying is, is really interesting because um, as we go to chapter 13, verse 14, illustrated here with Paul's burden, he came to Perga, Antioch, Pisidia, and went in the synagogue and sat down. Callie, as you said, he went and sat down. They said, hey, you know, That's you have a message for us, yeah. right? So he starts preaching. The interesting thing is, though, if, if we skim over his sermon and go to verse 42. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the very next Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on to say that the next Sabbath, the whole city came together to hear, hear the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. The word of God. So, yeah. so, so it's one thing that, um, uh, you know, he, he's a Jew. He naturally gravitates kind of towards the synagogue. That's where he's going to be hanging out. But you see the fruit of where God is leading in his life. Yep. And I, I think that's another distinction is, you know, we have callings, we have burdens, but then you have to step back and say, where has God been leading? Where do I sense him going? How is he speaking to me through his word? Mm -hmm. How are other people affirming the gifts that he's given me? Yes. Somebody very early on came up to my Christian experience. Have you ever considered being a pastor? And I had no interest in being a pastor. <laughs> and I resisted that in, you know, and, and went into missionary, mis ministry and then got involved in another kind of non-traditional ministry. And the Lord, you know, brought me back, but it took other people acknowledging gifts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and kind of looking at the, the, the long story and the narrative personally of where God has brought me from and mm -hmm. is continuing to lead me. And you see that similar type of scenario here in the life of the There Apostle should be a trajectory. Paul. You that's follow right. the fruit and, and there's a pattern of things that you see where the Lord is leading you. Yeah. And that's key because, Jared, even to finish out your point in verse 45, but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. So it's like the very people he has a burden for are the very people making his life and ministry difficult. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, no, don't you understand that because you're a Jew, Paul, other Jews are not going to be like, wow, he's like me. Let me check out what this brother's talking about. No, they're like, hey, you're like me. And the crowd is going after you and not me. 
So I'm now I'm jealous of you. Some some people, even though he has a burden for these people, mm -hmm. some people are almost too close to minister to. I don't yeah. know if you've ever seen that. Uh -huh. And it takes someone from outside of the circle to come around yes. and bless and, and connect with them. Because, well, I guess the example of Jesus. A prophet's not accepted in his own country. Absolutely. That's right. It's true. Let's go to chapter 13, verse 1 there. Something that, that a particular point that's, that stuck out to me. Was there certain prophets and teachers? There's Barnabas. We all know Barnabas, the mm -hmm. son of consolation. I just see him as a big, warm guy giving hugs to everyone. And, and, and you're a Barnabas. Uh, yeah, all right. Yeah. And, uh, okay. And then we yeah, have Simeon, who is all, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene. And then those two. I mean, you look at their backgrounds. This this could be possibly ancient Libya. This is northern Africa. Mm -hmm. So geographically, very diverse. Mm -hmm. And then you have Mananin, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. So you have this guy who's got old, you know, library, or not Library of Congress, but uh, <laughs> Congress or Congressional Government Connections, you know, yes. he's an upper class guy. And then you just have regular old Saul. <laughs> and Saul. Um, and you just, it's just cool to see that here we are at a stage of the church. who was predominantly Jewish in the beginning. The Christian church was predominantly Jewish in the mm -hmm. beginning. And now it's gone on to a chapter two stage, and now it's international, it's, it's multicultural. And now Paul has been called to this stage of, of ministry. Hmm. Um, let's, go, let's, just, uh, let's look at the, the ministry, uh, or the, the sermon that, that Paul preached. What are some highlights there from his sermon? It's, it, it must be of import when Saul, uh, Paul's sermon is recorded. What do you see there that's of particular import? Well, I think number Sebastian. one, look at verse uh, 16 and 17. Verse right? 16 and 17 of Acts chapter 13. 13. Mm -hmm. Paul said, the Bible says, Then Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. Mm -hmm. right? This is very interesting what he does. So then watch how he phrases it. He says, The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers mm -hmm. and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with an uplifted arm he brought them out of it. So immediately you sense that Paul is very aware of his audience, mm -hmm. that this is not just Jews I'm talking to. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't say our people Israel, right? He's like, oh, you know what? The yeah, God of this people audience. Israel yeah. chose our fathers. Mm -hmm. So he's this God of Israel, but he was actually the one who chose Israel. And then he calls them, they were strangers in the land of Egypt. And he's the one that brought them out with an uplifted arm. Mm -hmm. So he recognizes the fact that these Gentiles who are being treated as if they're strangers, you are outside of the promises of God to Abraham. But guess what? There was a time when we were. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly how he starts it. Mm -hmm. Sebastian, hold that thought. We'll come after the break and we'll look at the import of Paul's sermon in Acts chapter 13. Hey, welcome back. We're, we're in the midst of looking at Paul's sermon in Acts 13. And Sebastian, this is the beginning, so let's get to the end. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so this whole idea of when Paul is now starting his very first sermon in yeah. his very first mission in fulfilling God's purpose, it's almost as if the Holy Spirit... Recorded sermon. Recorded sermon, yes. yes. He was preaching Christ well before this. That's right. We saw that. Yes. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. So here you have, in his first recorded sermon... Paul being led by the Holy Spirit to be sensitive to the Gentiles because he knows I'm called to reach the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. If the Jews are blessed, great. But the way that he is conducting himself in his actual sermon is making sure that he does not offend the Gentiles mm -hmm. in the process. And I think that's very, very key because we say, you know, in business that, you know, you have to have a target market, so to speak. And this is not to put down the work of the gospel it's just a business exercise. But I think there is a lesson to be drawn from the fact that we say, if you don't have a target market and you're like, well, who are you targeting? Everybody. Well, if you're targeting everybody, you will reach no one. Mm. So we say you have to have very specific individuals in mind. So when Paul comes there, he understands the Holy Spirit has pointed him as an arrow in the quiver of God. Mm. You're aiming for the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So that's where you need to hit. If you get the Jews, great. But you're aiming for the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. It seems like that, that, that in, in, in one way that Paul is trying to be a very, very good Jew, 
Like, mm -hmm. if you actually look at the definition of a Jew, I mean, these Jews outside of the, the, the back to the Israelites and the seed of Abraham, the, the concept of being a Jew is so interlinked with the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they were to be a blessing to all the Jews. That's a, that's a part, this is your destiny as an Israelite, as a destiny <laughs> of a son of Abraham, a daughter of Abraham, bless the world. And here yes. the Jews are like, nope, we're just gonna <laughs> hang out by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so it's as if he's using even a more conservative, more traditional, more mm. ancient biblical argument. Good point. Let's be more Jewish than ever. Yeah. Yeah. And let's bless the entire world. And let's, let's, let's wait for the Messiah. And by the way, the Messiah came and asked Jesus. And you <laughs> killed him. Yeah. Great job. But you can for, and he's offering forgiveness. And let's, let's participate in God's role to save the world. Mm. I think that's a good point, kind of what's a side point of, you know, he's being kind of nice to the Gentiles, like I'm not trying to overwhelm you. But mm. he's also not holding back the truth. Mm -hmm. Because he could just kind of leave it there like, oh, yeah, and we're, the salvation will come. And well, it did come. I don't want to say it, <laughs> but he actually <laughs> names it in verse 23 of chapter 13. Verse From this, 23 of 30, okay. chapter 13. Mm -hmm. From this man's seed, according to the promise God raised up for Israel a savior, Jesus, mm -hmm. in case you're Boom. confused. Just, just make it That's plain. who it was. Yeah. Um, and politically him, incorrect, totally politically putting incorrect. him on their radar. He's yes. now on the CIA top 10. He is just he's named himself a target. <laughs> <Yes>. Recently died. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then even going down to verse 27, he's even more direct in a way. He says, For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. And in one way, just I kind of throws that in there. Yeah, I kind of read this and Paul's like, man, you kind of blasting kind of hard. But I kind of also see it like Paul is just so desperate to tell them the truth. Yes. It's like, this is this is Jesus. He's read every Sabbath. People still don't get it. I don't understand why, but moving on with my sermon. He's yeah. just like, it's so entrenched in his heart for him. Mm. Um, yeah, you see the forbearance. Like, this yeah. is every week, guys. Yeah. Why do you still not Every get it? aspect of our culture, our food, our <laughs> holidays, our language, our every our family, yes. everything is about this, and we miss the boat. Yeah, but don't that, you think that's yes. that's our experience even sure. now? Yeah, that's you know? true. I mean, it's you think us, about yeah, the fact absolutely. that we go through the motions of playing church. You know, you're just there and it's red every Sabbath. It's like every week we come to church, the same old thing. But people are not getting it. How do you know? Because someone's rude to somebody in the lobby. Because you're upset because someone sat on your pew that doesn't have your name on it. But technically everyone knows that's your seat. And now you're going to offend the sister. Or I don't like what you brought to potluck because we don't bring that to potluck. Did anyone give you the, the memo about what what's, we bring? I feel what's like potluck? he's talking about things that actually happened. Potluck, I mean. I feel like Sebastian's like talking about real experience. Potluck is a cultural <laughs> phenomenon you find in some, some Protestant churches where people bring food from all different sorts. And you never know where this food has been cooked. But usually it's good. That's and right. you're eating it together. Oh, Jerry, you're the anti-potluck guy. <laughs> that's right. He's an anti potluck -tarian. Yeah. You've been protesting I think another, for how long? <laughs> bring it back from Paul. Okay, Kelly? Bring it back real quick. Another thing that I think it shows that Paul does is though Paul is adapting the truth, he doesn't water it down. Mm. I think that's a temptation, especially when we're trying to reach hard to reach people. Yes. We're like, we can just preach this version of the gospel, and I just don't want to say that. Yes. Because then they'll know. Um, and I, I've experienced this while I was giving Bible studies and having a very spiritual conversation with an atheist friend of mine. And we'd had like a three hour conversation. He completely agreed with everything. So this is powerful. They asked me a question. I was like, oh, I know you're not going to like the answer to this. But like, Jesus, we could just bring him into the church and then just tell him this later. But Paul's like, I'm going to tell you the truth because I love you enough to tell you mm. all the truth. Mm. Even though I'm adapting it to you, but I'm still telling you all so the truth. So there's contextualization without compromise. Absolutely. And it's bathed in love. Mm -hmm. so I guess the really question well is, if we're not yep. speaking the truth in love, which is a great test verse, mm -hmm. we're just speaking the truth in not love. And that's yeah. a dangerous Which means you're actually not speaking the truth. Mm. Because in, in, in essence, you're setting people up to reject it as not the truth mm -hmm. by the method and the spirit in which you're delivering Absolutely. it. Absolutely. So in Paul's example here, when he's being faithful in context to, to the word and to the message that God gave him, it's resonating out. And I can just picture people standing at the gate saying, what is this guy saying? And then as he comes out, they're, they're um, approaching him saying, we want to hear more of what you said because you didn't dumb it down, right? That, that's crazy too because there are they could be taken as jabs to the Gentiles, right? Because yeah. the gospel is for the Jews first, and then Peter or Paul even says, like, yeah, we're giving it to the Gentiles because you guys didn't get your life together. Mm. And so as a Gentile, you could be like, well, I don't want secondhand gospel. <laughs> right. I don't want this shared with me now, but they're Left just like, overs. gospel, I don't care. I love mm -hmm. it. And so it even shows their humility and their willingness to be open to God, even though it's second mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. You know, no. 
Sebastian, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I was going to say, I'm, I'm moving on. To, so um, if you're on a to, road trip here, we don't want to get stuck in one yes. rest stop too long here. Yes, I don't, I don't want to be stuck here. Just to make this point of how fast Paul got to Jesus in his sermon. Mm. So this is a brand new city, first missionary journey. You're in a place you've never ministered before. Like we think about the fact, like Callie was saying, it's like, oh, you get to Jesus later. Mm -hmm. But Paul wastes no time. Yeah. I mean, he gets to Jesus very quickly in the sermon and continues to develop that as the meat and potatoes of what he's trying to serve to them. He did give context. Mm -hmm. he, he set yeah. it up. He gave a little bit of history, but then he brings in... He brings clearly in, was not procrastinating. Yeah. He's just giving it enough. The conclusion of the matter is found in verse 48. It says, <laughs> Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. There you again. You see the word of the Lord is kind mm -hmm. of another character in the book of Acts. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them from their region. This is uh, ch chapter 13, verse 49 onwards, 50 and 51, 51. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them, came to Iconium, 52. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So that's mm. so it's a kind of a good ending, but not a good ending, but a good ending. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then from this point on, they jump from city to city. They go to Iconium and, I don't know, there's other cities there. Mm -hmm. um, let's go to, Jared, can you read from verse 21, verse 28 there? In verse 13? Uh, chapter 14. 14. 14. I'm sorry. 14. Sorry. Mm -hmm. 21 through 28? Yes, please. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. Now, when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From there, they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended the grace of God for the work which they had completed. In verse 27 to 28, Sebastian. Now, when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith mm. to the Gentiles. Amen. So they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Yes, yeah, so you kind of see the conclusion of this road trip, their first missionary journey. What are some highlights we can pick out from some of these stories, from these accounts? What's going on there? I can go Kelly? to a verse you didn't read. Okay. okay. Yeah. Is that all right? Uh, well, we'll see. <laughs> Hopefully. Afterwards. Okay. Chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. Um, 14, 2 and 3. Chapter okay. 14. So, well, verse 1, they're doing ministry there. Verse 2, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Mm. Now, verse 3, I love the response to this. Therefore, they stayed there a long time. <laughs> speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So they go into this place, they're doing ministry, and the Jews stir up the Gentiles and poison their minds. And personally, my response would be like, well, I'll go somewhere else. <laughs> There's probably op more open fields than this. But their response is commitment and devotion. Mm. And I'm going to stay here a long time to put down roots and do this ministry that takes a lot more work than can other I, places. Can like. I complicate your problem even further? Sure, go ahead. Because in the very next <laughs> verse, it says in verse 4, but the multitude of the city was divided. Mm -hmm. Part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. Yep. So here you're also dealing with the fact that doing missionary work led to division. Mm -hmm. Right. And we live in a time where everybody wants unity and love and we should be together. But here we're seeing that just like Jesus's ministry, the fruit of being faithful to the message led to division. Everybody's not going to accept. And I think that's a critical aspect of missionary service, which is to come back to the fact that success is not results of getting everybody on board. Obviously, that's what we want ultimately and ideally, but success is being faithful. Mm -hmm. I went and told and preached the word of God, but the reality is it can and will produce division. Mm. I mean, let me kind of recontextualize the, the, the conversation here. So let's say you're a young adult and you're watching this on Inverse and I'm like, man, these are the four of the most best looking people I've ever seen in my life. Man, <laughs> this is a show. Thanks, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on social <laughs> media. I'm going to follow these people for the rest of my life. And they're, they're talking about this road trip. They're talking about this missionary journey. What's the takeaway for me? What does that mean? I need to go into a missionary field and then offend everyone so that half the city wants to kill me? Or I think what, what's 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 what? Going back to yeah. going back to an earlier point, the first question is, what has God called you to do? Mm. Um, there are 
literally billions of different kinds of ministries we can do, and it might not be what we want to do, but what has God called us to do? Mm -hmm. And then doing that with faithfulness, not based on numbers or results or social media or tweets of people baptized or whatever else. It is about being faithful to God has called us to. And then I think keeping something in mind, verse 22, where he says, we must through many tribulations enter 22. the kingdom of God. Sorry. Acts 14, 22. 14, 22, yes. Yeah. Acts okay. 14, 22. We must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Okay. And speaking of someone who is very easily discouraged in many different parameters of my life. As many um, millennials are. Yes, I'm very easily discouraged, very easily. Are you discouraged hey, hey, now? Hey. I'm discouraged, yeah, because you guys keep interrupting me. So, um, <laughs> I'm going to interrupt you. <laughs> anyways, <laughs> just so, like, just because there is division, just because people are poisoning their minds against you, just because you're not getting converts, because people, like, that doesn't mean God didn't send you. It doesn't mean mm. God isn't using you. Mm. You need to be faithful to what God has called you to, no matter the circumstances and what things look like. And so I think that's that's the biggest encouragement to me from Paul's life because mm. we think about Paul. He like wrote most of the New Testament. He's kind of a cool guy. Did a lot of great things. But his life was really hard. He got stoned, stoned and stuff. Stoned, shit so. wrecked. I mean, he's just, I mean, the list that he does, I can't even do but all that. But yeah. in a way, like, it's equivalent to the amazing things God did. Yeah. His life was so hard because God took him to do crazy things. So Callie's takeaway is, is tough it out. Yeah. Mm. Tough it out. And pray a lot when you're discouraged. Tough it out, but tough it out in the Lord. <laughs> yes, tough amen. Don't just get your teeth, like, surrender to Jesus. Okay. Some of the tribulations that, that you mentioned that they went through, I mean, imagine the experience of Paul in in chapter 13, the beginning. We didn't read this, but Paul's <laughs> trying to teach this guy the gospel, Sergio Paulus, yeah. and there's this sorcerer who's, I mean, this is straight up the devil trying to intervene and keep this guy from hearing the gospel. Yeah. The crazy thing is, the next thing, he's finding religious people in the Jews pushing back against the same way. So those tribulations, he's he's getting it from, from both sides. Yeah. So what you're saying is, don't be discouraged. If you're yep. striving to be faithful as a young person, don't be discouraged. You're going to have tension on this side. You're going to have pushback sometimes from even religious, well-meaning religious Absolutely. people. But strive I would say like our modern day contemporary young adults, like we got to tough it out. We've got to get we some do. more skin. Sometimes we don't want to go on a mission trip because there's no air conditioning. You mm. know, and so we got to just <laughs> tough it out in the Lord. <laughs> that's my prayer to be tough in the Lord. And that's not tough by my strength, mm. but Jesus' strength. Hopefully that's the prayer of my panel, panelists and, and you guys as well. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week here on Inverse.